Well, hello. Uh, I'm Dr. David Moliterno from the University of Kentucky, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Jack Cardiovascular Interventions, and I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, broadcast. Uh, over the next 40 or 45 minutes, I'm going to give you some of my thoughts, or as titled, Tips and Tricks for uh, Getting Papers into the Jack Family of Journals. But but really, since noticing that there's nearly uh, 1,400 people who have signed up for this uh, uh, session, and um, many were not necessarily uh, cardiologists or interventional cardiologists, I broadened the talk a bit so that I think many of the things I'll be saying uh, toward the middle and in the end of the talk actually apply to you know, submissions to any journal, uh, certainly tips and tricks that I think will help you throughout your, your career, and uh, you should enjoy it in the beginning. I will be talking specifically about the Jack family and Jack cardiovascular interventions. After that uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll have 15 or 20 minutes for questions, and I hope those of you joining us will uh, be willing to provide some questions, and I'll be happy to try to answer those for you. So now I'm going to go ahead and switch over to uh, the slides, and, uh, and there's my uh, title slide, and we'll walk forward. Uh, now, I do have some conflicts of interest, obviously being uh, the editor uh, uh, for Jack Cardiovascular Interventions, but I'm also on several other editorial boards. So the Jack family, as you may know, uh, started out just with Parent Jack, uh, as it's been called, with the, the current editor-in-chief being Dr. Valentin Fuster uh, at Mount Sinai Medical School in New York. But uh, thereafter, Jack Cardiovascular Imaging and Jack Cardiovascular Interventions was birthed, uh, so to speak, and uh, as have been a number of sister journals, as we call them, in heart failure, clinical electrophysiology, and then more recently, basic to translational science. And then in the past a year or so, Jack Case Reports and Jack Cardio Oncology, and you can see many of these on, on the internet and through the uh, ACC's uh, uh, portal. This is the, the broad uh, structure for today's presentation. As mentioned, I'm going to give some specific uh, overview numbers and metrics with regard to Jack Cardiovascular Interventions. And then I'm going to talk about constructing the best research, because really, if you have the best research, your paper is going to get published. Um, and, but uh, obviously, making that step from the publication, I'm sorry, from the research to the publication is what this is more about, and that's constructing the best paper to ultimately get it to the best journal and, and, and fully appreciated by the readers. And, and then toward the end, I'll mention some of the results once you submit your paper, what happens um, from there. So hopefully this will be a, a, a good um, structure for you, and I'll be coming back to this overview so you can see uh, where we are. So we'll start out with some overview here. And one of the first things I'll mention is while, while Jack and the middle part is American, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, no, this is really an international journal. And so as I put together the editorial board uh, for, as we call it, Jack Intervention 2.0, because the first editor-in-chief was Spencer King, and he was editor for, for 10 years and um, did, did a marvelous job. And now, me taking this on, I really wanted to uh, be sure that we were representing uh, the entire globe uh, with the editorial uh, board. And the masthead or the front matter of the journal lists that, as you notice, in most journals. But for ours in particular here, we have several deputy editors and associate editors. But that bottom bullet in the top part there is what I wanted to point out. These, these uh, editors are from 11 different countries. And then below you can see we have, um, on the next pages of the journal, more than 100 edi editorial board consultants or named reviewers, as we call them. But really, on any given year, there are about 700 reviewers whom we have to turn to to evaluate papers. We have guest editors who handle the papers that come from our own uh, editors. Uh, and then we have some social media and some editors who specifically focus on the images that are submitted to the journal. And here's just a, a picture of, of the group, and you can see just by looking at them, there is a, a nicely diverse uh, group of individuals from around the globe. Okay, so 
You know, one of the early questions already coming in is, has to do with how many journals are published. I think there's currently something 130-some cardiovascular journals in the world. I'm proud to say that Jack family has several in the top 10 uh, or top 12. However, the years go by, but including Jack Parent, um, the main journal, uh, Jack Cardiovascular Interventions, Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, and now Jack Heart Failure. And uh, Jack Cardiovascular Interventions remains the uh, number one interventional cardiology journal out there. But anyway, another question that's already come in is how many papers do we get a year? And this is the answer to that one. What I tell people is about 10 papers a day, uh, a weekday. So on any given weekday, Monday through Friday, I expect about 10 papers to come in. And even though I'm a busy cardiologist and chairman of medicine, I have to get to those 10 papers a day. And what I want to show next is where they come from. And, and about 70%, by the way, are coming from outside the United States. And so this is a representation of those countries from which papers are submitted outside the United States. And you can see here that uh, largely in uh, Europe, uh, Spain, Germany, Italy, France leading, uh, but also uh, the United Kingdom, and then in Asia, uh, China, and uh, Japan. And you can see in particular how China uh, has, has increased its numbers uh, uh, over the years in particular. Now here's the impact factor. I won't spend time on this, but this is a, a marker of how often your papers are cited in the subsequent two years. And this is how journals are ranked. And we have done extremely well, particularly in the last several years. OK. so. When people ask me what can I do to write a great paper, you know, it's interesting what I tell them to do is read a lot. Because if you read a lot, you'll start to emulate some of the best writing, and you yourself will become a good writer. But one of the ways you learn to write well beyond reading a lot is writing a lot. And so that really is the, the, the earliest suggestion to you is read top tier journals, whatever you think the best is in the field for you and notice how they write and notice how it's constructed and try to emulate that. So that's what I'm going to go to next, and that is constructing the best research. As I mentioned before, if you've got the best research, you're going to get it published uh, uh, in a good journal. So, and this is pretty simplistic too. You say, well, what are the best approaches or steps then for creating the best paper with the best research, and you have to ask the right question, right? So if you ask the right question, something that's topical, something that's novel, something that's interesting, uh, uh, people are going to want to read it, and uh, journals are going to want to publish it. So you have to, you have to distill and make sure you have the right question. Not necessarily always the question that's most interesting to you, but that's most interesting to the scientific or clinical community. And sometimes then it takes refining that question by getting other colleagues or mentors to help you distill and make that question ideal, right? It has to be able to be answered, first of all, um, and it has to be uh, answered correctly. And so that's what I say there for the second step is once you've defined the question, answer it correctly. And then uh, what this talk is somewhat focused on is being able to effectively communicate your research and its findings. OK, one of the earliest things you can do is if you have a journal which you are targeting for your research is read through the instruction for the authors. Uh, every journal has these, either in print, online, or in many cases both. And you should just take a few minutes to scan that, because if you put it in a format the journal likes to see, that's already a good sign, whereas if you have the paper formatted or structured in another journal's layout, that's usually noticeable. Um, for example, and without bias, if someone submits a paper to an American uh, English journal, such as Jack, but it's in British English, yeah, it makes us wonder if you submitted it to a British journal, particularly if you're not from the United Kingdom. And, and the reverse would apply, too, as if somebody from uh, the United States or Canada in particular might send a journal to a, a paper to a British journal, but it's in uh, uh, American English. They might wonder if they're the second or third uh, journal receiving that paper. So take a look at the instructions. Learn from those. Um, 
In jack cardiovascular interventions, we have multiple different categories, and that's something also you should pay attention to. Beyond just original research papers, there's other things, such as here state-of-the-art papers or images and interventions. And so several journals um, have uh, just one focus, but most journals will have different categories to which you can submit a paper beyond just original research. And so look at that. And what I did in particular uh, when becoming the editor is I actually put together editor's pages that described what we wanted to see in a state-of-the-art paper. You're not just a review of the literature, but it's even beyond a distillation of the current trends, but it's more of an expert, thoughtful approach to the contemporary delivery of care on a particular topic. And so that paper, you, you could go and find it if you thought about submitting a state-of-the-art work to our journal in particular. So too, we have a section called Images and Intervention. It's very popular, especially among um, younger uh, readers of the journal because they like to see images uh, and like to learn from those in particular. Okay, now more towards the best papers. We talked about asking the right question, and as I mentioned, it should be topical. It should be meaningful. So no surprise to anyone uh, in, uh, <laughs> in the living world right now, papers on COVID-19 uh, uh, are, are uh, quite popular. Now, we've only published a few just because so many have been published, but it's clearly a topical subject. I think if you looked at um, Jack Cardiovascular Interventions over the past year, you would see other uh, topical and meaningful subjects often having to do with structural heart disease innovations, most recently with tricuspid and mitral valve percutaneous repair options. But obviously you want to start with something that's topic and meaningful as opposed to taking an older topic that while you may study it well, it's not so relevant to the current literature or practice of medicine. The next thing is once you decide your question and meaningful subject, you need to figure out the best trial design possible. It may not be a trial, but still you need to think about if I were going to prospectively answer this question, should I do a trial to try to do that? And if not, then you can figure out other approaches that would be uh, relevant to the subject and category to which you're submitting your paper in the journal. But let's just continue the thought with a, a prospective trial and think about how to approach it. One thing, or one word rather, that I use is to protocolize. And that means to systematically do things, even if it's not a prospective study, if you set out in advance and define what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, what are the statistics that may be involved? What specific tables do you need to populate with data? That will help you to refine, again, the question, the hypothesis, and will help the paper just develop so much better uh, than it would have if you kind of stumble along, so to speak, without a protocol that's telling you what to do. IRBs, or Institutional Review Boards, or Ethics Committees, will often want to see what your plan is. And that could be also considered a protocol or protocolizing your thoughts for a group. And so that's another thing I would suggest to do, even if you don't need IRB approval or ethics committee review, is to put something actually formal down about your study. And here's something that seems a little bit uh, unusual to consider, and that's writing the draft version of the paper before the study starts. And you might say, well, what are you talking about? That's bizarre. How can you start writing a paper before the study starts? Well, you actually can, and I'm going to go through that in a few minutes. And that writing of the paper will force you to think more about what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and then how you're going to explain that when formally and finally writing that manuscript. Jumping back now to study designs, I think most people know this, but you know, obviously the weakest evidence, as noted on the left there, is going to be just a single observation of a patient or an event, and that's a, a case report. And there are some journals that focus solely on case reports, such as 
jack case reports where they, maybe it's not a single case, but that's what they focus on is not necessarily uh, prospective randomized data, but uh, cases that are sentinel and educational for the reader. But there's not strong evidence um, uh, with regard to that single case. But as you go on with consecutive patients in a case series, then into retrospective or cohort studies versus prospective cohort historical controls, you can see that we're now getting not only a larger group, but stronger evidence for the hypothesis we may be considering. Um, this will go all the way forward to a prospective randomized clinical trial, and then obviously if you go beyond a single center, you're going to uh, not only be a multi-center, but then you can go to other countries, other areas of care delivery, and have a multinational randomized clinical trial. And so oftentimes when I first categorize a paper that I'm looking at, I somehow think, where does it fall in this spectrum of evidence, weak to strong? And that then is going to give me my initial impression beyond the interest of the question, but my initial impression on the strength and desirability of this study and manuscript. Okay, I am pointing out another journal, and I'll give you several uh, tidbits like this where they talk about cardiovascular disease and clinical trials and give some points. I've enjoyed working with a number of these authors and uh, their icons, and I think this is a paper worth looking at if you want to understand um, strength and design of uh, trials in cardiovascular medicine. In there, they went through some of the things that I've just mentioned. They've codified it a bit and put it into this table about some of the key elements of large yet simple trials. And then I and other co-authors have a manuscript coming out uh, in the upcoming weeks ahead in uh, the Journal of the American College of uh, Cardiology talking about uh, contemporary study designs and stable ischemic heart disease. So be on the lookout for that paper. It follows some of this, this paper's information, but more specifically focused on ischemic heart disease, my area of interest. Okay, um, we're, we're moving along. We're almost halfway through, not quite, uh, but about 40% of the way through with my talk, and I'm still going on with uh, designing your study and putting together your manuscript, and we're talking about protocolizing and here you're clearly articulating your objectives and aims, your hypothesis, your measurements and statistics. And now you can see if you can do that in a protocol, you've already written about one-third of your manuscript, and I'm going to come back to that concept in just a minute. You should specify how you will design the study, the variables, the outcomes, etc. Now you may be thinking, oh, this is so obvious. Well, it is to those who are seasoned investigators and seasoned publishers but I think what I'm trying to do here is give a, a more of a broad overview for people starting out in the field and things they can apply throughout their entire career. This is a mistake I see often happening, for example, with early and even mid-career investigators is not involving a statistician early. You should always involve a statistician early as opposed to once you've collected all your data and you want them to come up with a, a p-value or a probability value for um, clinical uh, or statistical relevance. Um, but no, you should do that early on. A statistician is almost always going to be versed in uh, clinical science if there are a biostatistician, and they can help you then to consider, are you thinking appropriately? Do you have your design uh, the best it can be? And, and are you including enough power in your study to answer the question you're addressing. And so I, I strongly encourage to involve a statistician uh, early. Okay, I'm uh, passing the halfway point now and I'm going to start talking specifically about writing the best papers. And as I've already alluded to, you need to adapt this, in my opinion, right as you go approach. And that goes back to the idea of protocolizing. So writing a paper is not something you do when you finish and then you're getting ready to deliver the information. Again, in my opinion, I think you should start writing it and putting the meat, the basic stuff together even before uh, you finished. 
the the rationale that you put together for the um, ethics committee or for the uh, consent form for the patients, if that's the case, or the ethics committee, that's going to be the introduction for your manuscript. It's the rationale for why you're doing this study and some of the background uh, for the reader. That's the introduction. So too, if, if you've already got an analysis section proposed and the statistician has looked at it and you've said what you're going to be measuring, how you're going to be measuring it, you've basically put together the method section of your manuscript or you at least have a draft of it. And then as I mentioned, you can very early on create what are called mock tables. And it may be how many groups you're studying uh, along the, the horizontal or the top axis of the table. And then along the vertical axis, you may have all the parameters. You know, it could be age, height, weight, blood pressure, things like that. But you're creating those tables and you're already thinking about what am I measuring? Obviously, what you want is the primary endpoint to be sentinel uh, probably in your second table, which is going to include your results. So too, if you're going to be presenting your data at a meeting before it's published, you're likely going to be creating an abstract for submission to that meeting. And that abstract is going to include a discussion and a conclusion, and therefore you virtually finished your manuscript uh, right at the same time you're finishing your abstract for scientific session presentation. With regard to the introduction of the paper, uh, this is where I think some people stumble and they cannot be concise. Why? It's because they have so much information and so much passion and enthusiasm in their head, they try to give it to the reader. And that's an okay thing to want to do. But on the other hand, most readers don't want a long introduction. They want it to be relatively brief, to either give them enough introduction or background information that they can understand the what, uh, what is motivating or prompting you or the rationale for doing the study, and then from there the question. So that's why I say it really should be no more than three short paragraphs, again, in my opinion. It should be the background that they need to know. It should be what is not known or what's missing or what's the key problem with the current uh, knowledge and then how this study is going to attempt to address that unknown aspect of this area. And again, I think this should be a single page, several paragraphs, and sometimes a half a page is perfect. I would say the same thing about editorials, for example, and I'd like to do a future uh, Bright Talk um, presentation just on writing a good editorial because I think a good editorial often has a brief introduction and then goes right to the current paper that it's discussing and helps digest it for the reader rather than spending a lot of time on an introduction that the main manuscript about which the editorial is being written has already covered. Okay, so that's the introduction. Now moving to the methods, here's where it's crucial to pay attention to details. You must in your protocol and in your manuscript define the who, right? when and the where. What population are you studying from what dates to what dates and where are they located so that your reader can know that and make comparison not only to the rest of the literature but also to their practice or their area of study. You need to define what the outcomes are, what you're looking at, and that's obviously going back to your hypothesis when you're looking at it. And then lastly, how you're going to analyze the outcomes or what you're looking at. And this is, this is absolutely crucial, but now you can think back to how that was probably in your IRB uh, application or your ethics committee submission or in the consent form that you gave to the patient. You let them know who you were interested in studying, what you were interested in studying in those individuals, and then what you were going to do with the information. So. The last thing is more basic scientists will say this, but it applies to, to clinical trial science also, is that someone who reads your methods section should be able to repeat your study in their environment, in their laboratory, in their um, uh, institution or country, and be able to reasonably replicate what you did. Now, they may have different findings, of course, because of the different environment, 
um, but they should be able to use your paper as a template for their uh, uh, future work. Okay, here we go uh, now uh, forward um, with the results section. And, and what I'm saying here is this really is the most important part of the paper. Now I know especially younger readers will say, well, the abstract is actually what's most important. And, and it's the conclusion of the abstract because honestly, that's, that's what I look at. I hear some readers say, I look at the title and then I look at the conclusion of the abstract. But really, if, if you wanted to be able to only say one thing about your paper, it should be the results. It shouldn't be the introduction. It shouldn't be the methods even. It really should be your results because that's why you did this study and that's why you are publishing this manuscript is to convey those results to the reader. Obviously, it's in the context of the introduction methods and up next, the discussion. But it really is the most important and I find that some authors won't spend enough time here and rather they'll present their results in the discussion. And no, the results need to be in the results. You should always use subheadings, too, um, because the results may include uh, giving details about the population you've studied. It may specifically give dates, times, things like that uh, that, that would be helpful to, to the reader. And, and then the main results versus sub-results, and it's, I find it very helpful to be in subheadings, and it helps me as a a reader or a studier of the paper to digest it or to put it into uh, chunks that I can chew on and understand. But here's what I would say in presenting your results is to spend a major amount of time, and you notice I put it in capital letters, on the tables and figures. And this is what I've said to many people whom I've mentioned is that a single figure can tell the entire story of a paper and you may have noticed if you read Jack Cardiovascular Intervention and the other Jack journals, one of the main focuses or things we did to improve it uh, more recently was to put central illustrations in. Okay, and here I say never pr pr present a commentary. That should be in the discussion. With regard to tables and figures, I think you should study uh, key journals. And I didn't put the Jack family in there because it's a given, but you should look at key uh, journals in general medicine also, the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, and JAMA. Why? Is because they uh, exquisitely focus on high quality tables and figures. More so, you should study your target journal. And if it's a Jack journal, you should find a copy online or in print and look at it and see how the tables and figures are put together in that journal and try to emulate those. And that's what I say, imitation, or emulation is the most sincere form of flattery. And it also is going to be looked at by an editor who's used to looking in that format for a table or figure, and they'll like it. I give you just some short comments about avoiding rookie mistakes, and those are don't get overly fancy unless it's a journal that focuses on overly fancy. And so I say don't try to convey things in 3D figures. And that's where, again, studying the target journal will help you. But I think 2D figures are easier uh, to look at. Obviously, if it's an imaging journal and it has a lot of online things, and then 3D figures and 3D images may be appropriate and needed. Um, I say do include the number at risk on Kaplan-Meier curves. And if you don't understand that uh, point, you can read about it more, but in brief, a Kaplan-Meier curve is estimating uh, events uh, over time, but as patients have an event, they no longer are at risk for that event, and so the number of patients at risk decreases over time, and also some patients are, are, are lost to follow-up, and that's another, another topic uh, about uh, imputing data. You should define all abbreviations. Some authors sometimes, again, thinking in their head and not in the reader's head, uh, just put out abbreviations that are common for them to use, but maybe not for the reader. And I say do use footnotes aggressively, meaning say things in the footnotes that help the reader to better understand the table and the figures. Here, for example, as I mentioned a moment ago, is a central illustration. And, and for our journal, these can come hand-drawn, and we employ a professional or actually several professional graphic artists to make it look very nice for you. But this is a terrific example from a state-of-the-art paper where you can see the authors, actually very nice, 
uh, rendition uh, drawing, uh, but then you can see what the final product looked like. And so this is something attractive in the Jack journals, and uh, you should you should take a look at those because oftentimes they're um, uh, terrific and will give you some insight for creating your own uh, figures uh, for manuscripts. Shifting now to the discussion, I sh there should be an opening paragraph, of course, but this is going to very briefly articulate what you found so that if a reader wants to just get that first paragraph and get the main meat, they can do that. It is a way to digest and interpret or restate the results, the main findings of your paper. You're not restating them in, in burdensome detail with, again, repeating all the hazard ratios or odds ratios and confidence intervals and statistics, but it's more the, the, the words as opposed to the numbers in that opening paragraph, what you set out to do and what you did. The middle paragraph may, may be for the individual or sub-findings that were important to you, and it may also pull in the current literature or the current thinking and how your study fits in for the reader to understand. And then toward the end, sometimes, and I will say oftentimes, there should be a limitations paragraph or at least sentences why is because no paper is perfect and certainly no study is perfect. Obviously, that's why we use p-values to understand how our observations fit into the truth or fit into all uh, data if we were able to collect all data that exists uh, for a study, uh, which we can't. And so I think it's perfectly fine to uh, straightforwardly say what the major limitations or weaknesses were and how or why you addressed them for the reader to have perspective. And then lastly are going to be the clinical implications or the, the non-clinical implications are there out there also. So for example, I, the thing I wrote, or the paper rather I wrote in the last days, it had clinical implications, but it also had financial implications to the current healthcare environment. And so I took uh, some sentences to try to put it in context for the reader about why we should, as a society, afford financially, um, certain genetic tests for uh, specific patient groups, uh, but asking the question is how much will they cost versus the prevention of an untoward uh, event. Okay, ultimately is the conclusions, and this should be very brief, and it should reflect directly upon what your hypothesis or question was. Don't come up with conclusions that have nothing to do with your data because that's one of the questions we specifically ask reviewers, are the conclusions appropriate and justified for what the authors intended to do or convey? Sometimes the authors will, I don't want to say bend or twist conclusions, that's not quite right, but they'll rather try to focus them slightly in an area that's more favorable or seemingly attractive to the reader, but is not purely on topic or on task with the science or the way the study was designed. So be certain that the conclusions uh, are appropriate. Okay, um, a couple more comments on the discussion and then I want to shift uh, the last uh, uh, five to ten minutes of my talk for you, but uh, again, go back and look at the instructions to the uh, authors with regard to the discussion. Make sure that your references are in the right format. Please be sure to use the most up-to-date references. Now, I know some authors will try to use things that they've written themselves, but really try to come up with the ones that are the most appropriate. Some journals are specific, and they'll say, be sure all your citations or references are within the last, and then they may give you five years or last 10 years, uh, a timeline where possible. I will say that the more you edit, revise, and circulate to the co-authors of your manuscript, if there are co-authors, the better it will be. I say sometimes it may take 10 um, revisions to get a manuscript to be as perfect as I think it should be. And I know young authors don't like that, but I say no. You'll learn the more we circulate it, edit it, and revise it because it'll have more eyes uh, seeing it and more brains thinking about it. So, And it's fine. Just be ready for criticism and more revisions. That's, that's part of this process. Okay. So in summary, uh, with regard to writing the best manuscript, ask the right question, craft a clear, well-planned analysis, write as you go, 
Make sure the tables and figures are ideal because they're key. Revise, revise, and revise. Embrace criticism and be, be strong and sturdy. Uh, don't give up. Be tenacious. If the study was worth doing, it was worth publishing. Even if the results were negative or even if the first journal rejects your paper, if you really thought it was worth doing, it's worth publishing, in my opinion. Okay. There are resources to help you, by the way, um, if you're an author and you need help, Elsevier's website. I haven't been there uh, recently, but when I put this slide together um, some months ago for another audience, I, I found this link, and it's a, you know, a place for authors to read and get more specific help. And so, too, they have other resources and on skills and ideas and things like that. And so I really appreciate Elsevier doing that, and I'd encourage you to go to their website and uh, see what things you can glean from it. The paper's finished, now what? So my last comments are going to be getting the right journal and writing the right cover letter, um, and then what to do when the paper is um, ultimately uh, reaches a decision and comes back to you. So again, make sure you've got the right journal. I would say about oh, maybe 5% of all papers we receive probably should have gone to a different journal. Um, make sure you have the correct formatting for the journal. We talked about that. Select the correct category. We talked about that. And then, and then constructing a cover letter, which there are various opinions about that now, come to those. And so, you know, I used to say how, how to write a cover letter, but I guess the question might be why to write a cover letter. And there are several reasons, in my opinion, but it is controversial, and I, I, I pulled this out of an anesthesiology a, a journal, and it says uh, cover letters are a controversial topic. Some journals ignore them, and others pay very close attention to them. But I think there are opportunities. I wouldn't spend a, a huge or inordinate amount of time writing a cover letter, but some journals require them at the very least because they want to know who's the corresponding author and confirm that, and they want to know these uh, four elements that are in the ICJME requirements, and those are that you say the paper's not in consideration elsewhere. They want to be sure you're not sending it to several journals at one time. They want to make sure that the results aren't copyrighted or published elsewhere. They want to make sure that not only you, but all your co-authors have not only read the paper, but they approve this version that's being submitted. And they want to know that you've reported any conflicts of interest that are important uh, to be known. Okay, so I think a cover letter is important because it's a first impression, right? That may be the first thing that people click on and see. I think it should be nice. I don't think it should be, uh, you know, obviously handwritten and scanned. It probably should be on your letterhead. Um, it should have the pro proper, you know, style and grammar and uh, things like that. Uh, here's just an example that I used many years ago, but. I could almost use this to this day because it's just a matter of pulling in and out uh, the title of the paper and some other things. Uh, but, you, you know, I use something largely like that uh, earlier this week when I submitted a manuscript to a journal. It may be the only chance for you to speak candidly uh, about the paper. It may make, uh, or it does provide an opportunity to you make requests, like if you want the the editor or the person uh, bringing the manuscript into the journal for consideration. You may say you want certain people to review it or not review it, or you may want may remind them of an upcoming deadline or if you're presenting it at a scientific meeting. Um, and there may be certain associate editors of that journal to whom you've already spoken about the paper, and you may want to relay that information also. Okay, it's an open platform. You can talk about why you think your paper is important for that journal and for the readers to see at this time. And you can come up with several reasons for why you think it's important for that journal. Okay, um, why you want to do it? I think it's required. It's a good first impression. It may be the chance to speak candidly. You can let requests known and uh, it, it's also a way for you to state the value of the paper to the readers, which is what the editors uh, are thinking about and to whom we're responsible. So result of the submission process, what happens? And here's, here's some my off-the-cuff thoughts uh, rounding out uh, my talk, and that's what happens. And I would say if you're told it's a provisional acceptance, 
with minor revisions, the paper's very, very likely to be accepted. And one of the questions that came in earlier is, you know, what percentage of all submissions are accepted? And I think overall in the Jack family, it's around 10 to 15 percent of original research papers are accepted. And so you can see here, if you get a revise and reconsider, you're still uh, above uh, a coin flip, so you're at 60% or higher in my opinion. If you get a reject, but it says de novo, meaning if you make a lot of changes, we'll reconsider it from the beginning as new, it's going to have a, a much lower but higher than um, overall average. And then lastly, you might get a, a straight reject. Uh, Dr. Demaria, um, uh, the last editor, uh, the one before Dr. Fuster, wrote this on manuscript revisions. I think it's worth looking at. What he said is of the 40,000 papers he looked at, not one was perfect and they all needed some form of revision. Um, but you should expect good peer review in this cartoon, which sometimes feels like what you're hearing when you get a de novo reject is somebody just crossing out everything that you've done and you feel like asking, is this really peer review? Um, I think a de novo reject is what I would call a second chance at bat. It can be confusing because on one hand you're told it's rejected, but on the other hand you're told, hey, consider resubmitting it again if you think you can make a substantial change to the paper. So I'll let you look over that slide and re-look at this presentation because I'd like to close in the next few minutes to have some time for questions. What I would say in resubmitting a paper though is you should try to resubmit it promptly. If you wait months and months and months, it, it, you, you know, it may be forgotten by the journal. Um, we may think that you're sending it to another journal and now it was rejected by them and so you're coming back to us for that second chance at bat. So I would say try to, within a month or two, resubmit it. Now if you're asked to make a dramatic number of changes, it may take you a time longer, but I would try to be prompt. I would make your rebuttal comments compelling and pointed, direct, uh, one by one, um, you can provide a, uh, you should provide additional data as requested and be precise. And you should always be courteous, not only in your rebuttal to the reviewers, but also to the editorial group. I think when you write a rebuttal letter, you should, it should be a separate document. You should literally restate the questions or the points brought out by the reviewer and how you answered it. Now, if you don't agree, you can politely and respectfully disagree in your rebuttal comments, but you need to say why, um, and that's very important to give the why. So I tried to cover um, over the last 40 minutes or so these high-level uh, things about Jack and Jack cardiovascular intervention. I tried to give you some thoughts about what is the best research and how to construct it, and then the idea of protocolizing early on and writing your paper as you go, and then some thoughts about the submission process. I really think this was terrific opportunity for me, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping that I can do a few more of these on more specific topics, and so would love to have questions or queries now or feedback from the audience about that was nice, but I was hoping to hear about this topic or that topic. And, and we'd be very pleased, uh, along with the Bright Talk group, Elsevier and the Jack family to try to come up with a, a presentation for that a topic. So as promised, we have um, about 15 minutes and we can take uh, less if there aren't so many questions and we can uh, try to get through as many as we can. So let me uh, take a look over here at the questions and there are many and I'm going to just scroll down through and Pick out some and don't be offended if I don't get yours. It looks like we have uh, 48 questions so far, so I'll, I'll try to get to as many as I can and some are likely duplicates. So let me just scan down through. Okay, uh, when submitting, when a paper is rejected by Jack, is it best for the author to respond to the reviewer's comments and revise before submitting to another journal in the Jack family? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a secret insight here. So, all the Jack family editors in chief, so I, for example, am part of uh, not only the Jack family, but I am an associate editor for uh, the main Jack journal. So, 
It's so I see all the papers that are being considered by MainJack, and I can be involved with the editors' conference calls. And sometimes, if I see a paper is not being accepted by Jack, but I think it's appropriate for my journal or another journal, we make that recommendation right then and there. And sometimes, in a rejection letter, it might say, "You should consider submitting this to," and then they'll list the Jack. Family Journal to submit it to. Uh, and I think it's up to you. I think it can go either way. I think Jack is a higher impact factor journal and more globally read, more broadly read. I think that if you can get a paper in Jack, main Jack, I think that's where I would target. Whereas if it's, you know, I, I guess more critically reviewed and you don't think you can answer all the comments uh, as easily and it will have a higher priority in a daughter journal or sister journal, such as Jack Cardiovascular Intervention, we'd be happy to see it there. Okay, how long does a review process normally take? Great question. So I can say that um, if a manuscript does not go out to external review, meaning that it's looked at by the um, editor-in-chief, and I'll say that of the a couple thousand papers that come to Jack Cardiovascular Interventions each year, I look at every single one of them. I personally look at all of them. Well, I'm on vacation two weeks of the year, and so I may not look at those at that moment, but I do when I'm back. Um, and I would say that one in three, and that may sound like a harsh number, but I'll say one in three may not get sent out for peer review. And so you're going to get an answer pretty quickly on that one, maybe within uh, one to two weeks. Why is because I read it, I thought about it, I talked to the other editors. We agreed it's not going up for review, and we're going to answer your question promptly. If we send it out for reviews, it's going to add in several more weeks uh, because it's got to go to those reviewers, be reviewed, come back to us, and we digest their reviews. If you take those two extremes one week and about four or five weeks, you're going to come back at about three weeks. And so for most of the Jack journals, it's three weeks. What is the impact factor of the Jack journals? They range from those that are from around seven up to around 20. So very high, again, several in the top 10 or so of the more than 100 cardiovascular journals. There are a couple of the journals that are newer that do not have an impact factor yet. Um, are query letters a thing of the past? I think if you mean letters to the editors, uh, they're absolutely not. I think they're less popular nowadays with social media, but we do have several still. We also have research correspondence, which are shorter manuscripts or less scientifically sound. Do editors um, and their editorial board ever reach out to published experts to suggest the state-of-the-art review paper be written by them? Yes. Not so commonly, but absolutely. Sometimes we'll think of a topic and we will uh, come up with a short list of names of individuals and we may reach out to them to do that. A state-of-the-art paper is a lot of work. and Why? We expect it to be the best of the best. And so it's not an easy undertaking. And so we're a little bit reticent to reach out to too many people to do them. I know the Jack Parent Journal uh, does it more so for their reviews, which they've heavily focused on recently. And by the way, have done just a terrific job with them. Sir suggests some tools to create awesome images. Wow, that's mainly software. Um, so I think I could talk a lot about that, and maybe that'll be a future topic, is how to create the best images and interventions, or just image submissions. You know, the Jack Cardiovascular Imaging Journal and Jack Case Reports have done a good job. But in my opinion, I think the future is going to focus on more images and more abstracts, the living abstract. And that's what I've proposed. I don't want to give too much away, but just a central illustration where you can scroll over it and get the main points of the paper uh, right there. I think that would be so neat. Your tips for young authors on how to get a review published. Well, I think it goes back to most of what I've just talked about already, but I would say find a mentor who can help guide you to say, is this the right review? Is this the right topic? Um, and again, but again, I would say once you find that topic, what I tell my fellows and young uh, faculty is you should become the local expert on that topic, whatever it might be. When I was very young, my mentor told me about a vasospastic angina or Prince Metals angina and told me I should read, read everything in the literature on that topic and then put together a grand rounds presentation and try to become the local expert on it. Or pregnancy and heart disease or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. 
there's many of them, but I think it's then finding the right journal, how long the review should be, and uh, go, go from there. Uh, does, the paper, does the paper must be altered for a specific journal or be published anywhere? Not sure I totally understand the question. Does it have to for a specific journal? Um, not sure. I think that you can send a generic manuscript to just about any journal, and if it's really, really good, they're going to work with you to change it into the format they need it. Having said that, I think with the right effort, you can format it for a specific journal and make it a bit more attractive. It's like you know, going to a costume party and wearing the costume of theme. So if it's on, uh, I don't know, if it's on cartoon characters, you probably shouldn't go dressed as somebody in a, a military outfit, I guess, unless there's a cartoon character like that. But I, I would say that. Can you do a systematic review with 10 papers or less on a topic? I think it would be tough. You can do a meta-analysis, but I think a systematic review would suggest that there's only 10 papers on that topic. I think if they're very different, and you've suggested ethnicity um, and post-operative nausea, hmm. Yeah, I don't think so, but it may be possible. It depends, again, how extensive the literature is. Um, I want to do an observational retrospective study of 100 or 200 patients, but most journals would not accept it. Yeah, I agree. I think of something like that. It may go to, say, a case report journal, um, but I think a retrospective observation of 100 patients can be fraught with challenges. Um, what I would suggest you do is something like that, but then do it prospectively on 50 patients. And so do 100 retrospective and then 50 or 100 prospective and see if you can prove your hypothesis uh, with that. I'm going to just keep reading quickly. We are probably under 10 minutes, and if I've skipped over your question, I'm sorry. Are innovative ideas with valid and relevant hypotheses, but still not a very large patient population, Consider for publication in Jack, and, and the ab answer is absolutely, but likely uh, in a different format. So as I mentioned earlier, we specifically created uh, what's called research correspondence, and I think I did an editor's page specifically on the category of research correspondence. It's going to be brief. Um, uh, specifically, it should be eight or 900 words. Um, it's going to have a limited number of authors. I think it's 10 or less. It's going to have five or fewer references. And this is where we're looking for novel ideas, maybe uh, pilot studies, which are going to have fewer patients, um, or um, n not solidly proven um, information, say, from a, a, a large administrative database that doesn't have granular data to it. But I would say absolutely you can have innovative ideas but a small population. You know, for example, first and man studies um, obviously are very novel, and we publish those, and they may only have 10 patients in them, but they're going to be really cutting edge, like the first time a, uh, uh, a valve repair device is being used uh, in a popul in, 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 in among humans. Please, why is it not good to put a figure in 3D? Oh, I think you can almost always get the information in 2D, and I think it's sometimes difficult to display data in 3D. Oh, I don't think it's bad. Don't misunderstand. I think you can do it. I just personally like it better in 2D. I think 3D can be just a little more challenging. But if you said I'm going to do three 2D figures or one 3D figure, then I might go towards the one 3D figure. But my comment was more general. And remember, throughout my talk, I think four times I said, in my opinion, because that's that's mainly my, my, my views. What are the points to be kept in mind while writing a manuscript as a beginner? Yeah, I think I gave you those, and that is don't try to, um, you know, create a, a super long paper with a lot of words. You know, it's been said many times by others. I would have written to you a shorter letter, but I did not have the time. You know, the, the best things are in small packages, and I think the opposite is is when you just write and write and write, and then you start getting fatigued and discouraged by how long and how much work it's taking. So I think the, the best points are to find a mentor. Find somebody who's very good at writing, uh, somebody who's a critical thinker, and let them guide you along the way. Other points I tell younger writers is to pick, pick two different types of things you're going to write. 
something that you can do at any time, like a review article. You can pick it up and sit it down anytime. In something that needs more of your attention in, in spurts, but needs it now. So that may be a prospective study where you maybe only have an appropriate patient once a week, and that's when you need to put a lot of time at that moment for the patient when they're available. Do all human studies require ethical clearance? Um, that would be a whole other topic that we could do, IRBs, ethics committees, and clearance, and the answer is no. If it's de-identified data and or specifically chart review, you often won't need a separate ethics clearance. Having said that, most ethics committees still want to be notified and give you an exemption that you don't need full uh, review, um, uh, but they like to be aware that you're doing it. How to write a better title? Oh, fantastic question and even so simple sounding. Again, shorter is better. And currently most, I wouldn't say that, currently some journals require a specific word limit and that has to do with the internet and searching and indexing titles. And so, for example, in Jack Cardiovascular Intervention, uh, we like titles to be 15 words or less, but that again goes back to search engines. Uh, um, what I would say, a, a, what you don't want your title to be is a conclusion, and I think that's what some authors want to do. To me, when it's a conclusion, I think it's not as scientific because you've already made a conclusion. And what you do when you approach science is you go in unbiased, without a conclusion. Certainly you have a hypothesis that leads you in one direction, but if you give the conclusion in the title, I don't like that personally. I like it to be a little bit more provocative or say specifically what you're studying and your conclusion should be just that, your conclusion. So a better title is short, it's provocative, it doesn't use words that people don't know or need to go to a dictionary to find, and it grabs people's attention without being misleading. What kind of journals do you read? <laughs> oh, unfortunately, not as much as I'd like to. Why? It's because I'm reading manuscripts all day long. But I, I read several. I try to read uh, Jack, uh, of course, because it's the journal to which I'm aligned. And I would say I look through uh, the key general medical journals, uh, uh, JAMA and the New England Journal in particular, and sometimes Lancet but I'm biased there. I'm looking mainly for uh, cardiovascular papers. How do you decide which journal is best for publication? That is another thing that a mentor and co-author should help you with, people who have experience. I often say come up with three, paper, three journals, the one that you think you absolutely will get into, the one you might get into, and the one you're likely not to get into, and then pick one of those latter two. Certainly you don't want to send it to a journal that's just going to immediately reject it without review every time because that's not helpful. But maybe a journal that may not take it but is going to give you good, thoughtful, critical reviews, um, and that may be where you want to start. Um, what do you read before you decide yes, no to send to reviewers? Oh, gosh, another really terrific question. The whole paper, the cover letter, the abstract. Well, uh, I must admit I will look at the abstract first. Um, what comes to me is what's called a face page, and it has the data about how many words, um, it has the authors, the title, and it has the abstract. And so I can very quickly see the title and the authors, but I must admit I have to go and click a separate link to get to the cover letter because it's usually an embedded PDF. But the abstract is there, and so I can scan it quickly. Um, from there, I can usually get my first general impression, but obviously I need to go into the paper. Do I read the whole paper? The confession would be is no, I don't read the whole paper if I am confident it is going in one direction or the other. If I'm not certain, if I'm ambivalent, yes, then I need to read more of the whole paper, but I don't need to look at all the tables and figures for a, a paper that I'm sure needs to go to uh, external peer review and to an associate editor. So my first step is sending it to an associate editor who then also reads it and decides about sending it to reviewers. Whereas for me, if, if it's the wrong journal uh, or, a, or a topic that we've already got multiple papers on and this one's of lower quality, yeah, I'm probably not going to go through the references and the figures, but uh, probably within the hour I'm going to be able to respond and make a decision that we've already got several of these meta-analysis under consideration or we have other papers currently in press that are 
of higher quality, in my opinion. Uh, why are my some papers rejected immediately with a comment they are not interested but accepted by another journal? Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty common, uh, by the way, and so don't be offended by that. Um, like I said, uh, we're only going to end up being able to accept 10 to 15 percent of papers. Why? We get many more than we could possibly publish. Um, and so for us, it may hit, say, uh, 16 or below that, or it just may be we've already got two papers on this topic that we're ready to present, and while yours is good, you know, we're not going to retract or tell the authors of the other papers we're going to now reject their paper when we initially said we we're going to accept it. So sometimes yours was just a little bit too late uh, to the party, so to speak, and we can't take them all. But I would say that many good papers, yes, they're published in another good journal, and sometimes I'll get an email or a letter from somebody saying, you wouldn't review my paper, but you know your competing journal accepted it. Uh, and I write back saying, I'm not surprised it's a good paper, but as you may know, we've got two very similar papers that we published, you know, in, in the last issues that, that yours, um, you, you know, came too late for us to consider. I don't always have time to write to authors to explain that again, because remember, 80 to 90 percent of papers are being rejected, and I can't write individual letters, and so use a form letter. Sometimes I will put in extra sentences to explain that, but not always. How much time do you spend discussing a paper at initial decision? Oh, gosh, another great question. Love it. Um, it depends on how many papers we have that week. We do weekly meetings. Um, I try to uh, not take so many papers for discussion. So a confession is if a paper is really good, really, really good, and the reviewers and the associate editors say, look, this is a great paper, yeah, it moves forward. We don't discuss it. In contrast, if a paper was given a reject by both reviewers and a reject by the uh, associate editor, and I read through it and think it's a reject, we're not going to discuss it much at all. I ask the associate editors to look through the entire list of papers, which we have on the docket for that week, but no, we won't spend time talking about it. What we spend most of our time talking about are the papers in between, and that may not be a long time. That may be five to ten minutes on a paper. It depends. Sometimes it's uh, very easy and sometimes no. It takes us going uh, back and forth and we may even need to hold it uh, for a, a future meeting. Um, uh, does the journal have a word limit for a cover letter? Not to my knowledge. I do not think so. Um, I wouldn't make it super long. I think one page is enough. Um, two pages is I, I don't remember three pages. There are not uncommon that they'll be two pages, depending on how big the letterhead and the, the signature line is. But us, usually one page, I don't think there's a word limit. Can we have a list of Jack journals so we know where we can submit our manuscripts? Yeah, I put those in the very beginning. You can also go to uh, acc.org and click on Jack journals. And so they'll be there, and there's hyperlinks to each of their sites, and then hyperlinks within those hyperlinks to let you know how you can submit a manuscript. And you can also go to Elsevier's website to see all the family of Elsevier published journals, because there are others in cardiology beyond the Jack family that Elsevier publishes. How much uh, is it important to cite references from the same journal? It's not important. Um, some journals may do that to gain their impact factor. It's not important. We're really looking for the best papers for that citation, not necessarily from, from our journal. Um, and so, like I mentioned, sometimes I'll look, and if I notice that an author is publishing a, or citing a lot of their own works, but they're not in good journals, and I know there's a better quality paper, but that author didn't write it, sometimes I'll ask them to change it for what I believe is the better paper. Uh, what is the meaning of a high-quality journal? Well, that's, that's relative. You know, what is the meaning of a high-quality uh, newspaper or um, magazine? I think it's up to the reader to, digest, to discern that. There are a number of different metrics that have been used in the past and are being used presently. What the Jack family has looked for is the number of original scientific publications that are cited by other original scientific publications. So some journals get a high impact factor, for example, by um, review articles or guideline articles because guidelines are cited a lot. 
and so they will encourage or ask authors to cite guidelines. But Dr. Fuster and the Jack family of editors and chiefs don't believe in that. We really want to have um, a, a jur journals that are most impactful to the reader. So we focus most heavily on original research publications, and I think our impact factor regarding those, as opposed to, again, review articles and other things, is, is among the highest of all cardiovascular journals. Okay. Um, why do you prefer passive or active in text of articles? Yeah, I'm not sure I know that. Um, maybe it, you're talking about like uh, Microsoft or Word programs that um, huh, that that, uh, that we often write in passive uh, verb tenses or uh, sentence structures as opposed to actives. Gosh, I'm not not otherwise sure of what you mean. What is the process to become a reviewer? I like that question also. Let me jump there. There isn't a process so much. We what I do. Uh, I can answer that as I ask the associate editors for their input and opinion. Um, if they know of individuals, I ask them to personally vouch. What I would suggest you do is find somebody who is already a reviewer, perhaps at your own institution, ask them how they got involved. I think once you become more published on a topic, and I'll just pick pregnancy and heart disease, yeah, you're going to become, you're likely going to be asked by a journal then to review a manuscript about pregnancy and heart disease. So I think the more you published, um, the more you're likely to become a reviewer. I think the other thing is to be a great reviewer. And what I recommend to many junior colleagues or to fellows in training is to ask uh, senior leaders or current reviewers, may I review a manuscript with you? And I do that myself and I ask that person to review the paper first. I review it separately. We review our comments together. And when I upload my review, the journals will often ask, or if not, I write in there, that this paper was reviewed with my colleague or my fellow, and then I put their name in there. Sometimes reviewers will say, please consider inviting this person for future reviews. So once you become a reviewer, however, you may not become a named reviewer. And so that's why I say do a good job if you're going, and I have a whole other talk on that, and I'd be happy to deliver that sometime uh, about how to be a good reviewer. But if you're going to review a paper, do a good job with it. Um, or, or just d don't accept the reviewing request. Um, why is when you review a paper, you're going to get graded. You're going to receive, you're going to, as a reviewer, uh, get several grades, and we keep track of all those grades or scores, and we tally them. And, Every once in a while, I and the other editors and chiefs will actually put a list together of the top reviewers for our journal. But quite commonly, when we decide who is going to be a named reviewer, so again, I mentioned we may have 700 reviewers of manuscripts uh, for Jack Cardiovascular Intervention this year, but we may only select the top 100 to actually be put in print and named as a name reviewer. Now, on your curriculum VT, you can list yourself as an ad hoc uh, reviewer once you start reviewing papers for a journal, but to be listed as a named reviewer or an editorial consultant is a yet a higher recognition that some people want. Okay, how do you deal with plagiarism? Oh, you should know about this. It's important. So there are software that is used that journals are scan that manuscripts are scanned to look for that. But how do we deal with it? Well, obviously we uh, try our best to catch it up front and uh, not accept the paper and let the author know that, you know, because of a high degree of word homology, as we like to say, uh, with another paper. Sometimes it'll be the same author who's reciting their work or rewriting their work. And if we think there's too much overlap, we may reject the paper and say, we believe it has too much overlap with a prior publication. You may resubmit the paper if we misunderstood or there's novel findings, which we missed. Uh, but usually those papers will not come back to it. If there's frank plagiarism that's caught afterwards, we have uh, a way uh, that we internally, uh, not with a formal ethics committee, but in such a way the, the college, the American College of Cardiology, does have an ethics committee, but I would say almost always uh, within the family of editors, we can address it and decide a judgment, and then depending on that judgment, uh, we will let the authors know about it and 
sometimes it, very rarely there needs to be a retraction um, but yeah there is a uh, process through which we address these okay we're coming close to the end I'm scanning to see if there's any particular questions how to submit a pre-submission inquiry uh, by email question mark yes you can I don't like it but you can absolutely do it and I'll honor it the why don't I like it oh because it then just takes more time I'd much rather you just submit it um, then I can show that our submission numbers keep going up as they usually do um, and it gives me a chance to spend more time with the paper when it's um, now if you just send me a topic and say hey what do you think about this topic you know chances are you know you should have already answered the question by doing a uh, a literature search on the internet or PubMed to see how much of it's been published or ready um, and chances are you can ask a mentor about it but I, I still get these uh, not daily but I would say weekly at least from somebody saying they've got a, a topic and I do address them by email um, but but I almost rather people if you really think it's it's worth publishing again you should just do the paper because if it's really worth doing you'll get it published somewhere um, but if you've already got a manuscript near complete or complete, I would say just submit it to us and let us take a, a, take a look at it. Do you have a trainee reviewer program for young doctors? Uh, we don't accept in our own institution. I think you can ask in your institution about it. I think if you have a society, um, you can ask that society to work with you. So, for example, um, I often go to the Italian Interventional Cardiology Society meeting, so-called GISE. They have a, a, a program for young GZA, they call it, and I've been there and spoken to them. But you may ask if your cardiology society or if your university, if you're at one, has one. We certainly, I and the other editors and chiefs, uh, are happy to be invited as a visiting professor or come as a, a guest editor, and I've done that and delivered talks like this and worked with young doctors. But I think it's best to find a mentor who can actually help you and groom you in your uh, uh, career. Um, any software for references arrangement? Yeah, I personally use EndNote. There may be others. Microsoft Word may be maturing enough. It embeds EndNote in it, and so I like that. Tips to review a review article. I have um, have um, other talks about that. I'm going to scan quickly here. Oh boy, other questions. Can rejected manuscripts be modified and submitted to the same journal? The answer is yes. You can always write an appeal. I would say that it, it, it's very rare for a paper to be accepted after a complete reject, but you can absolutely write an appeal. That's your right to do that. The editor's right is to, so to speak, reject the appeal and not send it through the formal process again. Um, every once in a while, uh, if the argument is strong enough, if you say, look, the uh, both reviewers clearly didn't understand uh, um, uh, my paper, um, and it's possible, it's unlikely, but it's possible. Why? It's because the associate editor and the editor is going to read the reviewers' comments, and if they clearly didn't understand the paper, we picked the wrong reviewers, and chances are we're going to get you new reviewers even before you know it. But every once in a while there may be one reviewer who missed something, and it was frank, and maybe we missed it, and we'll go back then and re-review it ourselves as editors, and then we'll decide whether or not it should be sent out to a new reviewer. But you have that right, but I will say that uh, frankly rejected papers and appealed papers do not commonly become so good that they get published again. But what we would like rather is to believe that the reviews were helpful for you to modify and improve the paper for another journal. Um, how to avoid uh, too much self-citation in my research paper? Any tips? Yeah, send it to your co-author, send it to mentors, send it to others, and uh, see. If you're really the, the, the expert on a topic, yeah, you're going to need to cite your own work. But if you are citing your own work, like I said, and there are other papers cited by other authors that's yet bigger or more robust, you should be citing their work. But I don't think it's a problem to cite yourself or your papers once or twice in a manuscript, but if but if um, many citations are just the papers you've written, yeah, th then I would try to avoid that. But the tips are is you should know the literature and PubMed and big, figure out if there's better citations than their own. But if there aren't, well, then you should go ahead and just cite your own work. But 
but that again is going to be less common unless you are really the, the grand poobah on a topic. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah. So I think we're going to go ahead and wind the session down. We're we're at uh, 75 minutes, and I know that's uh, close to the close to the the, the, the time we're we're done. So yeah. Let me just uh, click back to me and say, uh, you know, thank you again for uh, participating in this session. And you know, I really enjoyed it, and I, I hope it was of value to you. And uh, thank you again. And please consider the Jack family of journals when uh, when when submitting your work. So thank you very much, and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day.